Wait, wait, wait. That look is so 2023. There, that's better. Welcome to Reverse Engineering News. I'm your host, Hash. Thanks for joining. Now, our first story is about reverse engineering trains. It's a classic story, as old as manufacturing time. Person buys train, person drives train, train needs service. Manufacturer says they're the only ones that can service train, even though other shops should be able to. Now, the manufacturer of these trains has been threatening to sue anyone that even says their name. Nevag. She could sue me. <laughs> sue me, sue me. Now, in 2016, a Polish customer started purchasing these trains from Nevag, and they acquired 11 of them, and they continued to acquire more over time. And in 2021, they hit the 1 million kilometer mark. That's a special mark. They need to have service performed at that time. So a tender was put out for this major service that needed to be done on these trains, and anyone could bid on this tender, and different ones did. And the one that ended up winning was a company called SPS. Now, they're no stranger to working on trains. It's their whole business. But what happened next is rather funny. They started servicing these trains, but any time they would perform the service, the train wouldn't start back up. Another shop experienced the same thing as well. Now at this point, SPS is starting to get suspicious. So they go on to Google. They search for Polish hackers and they come across just the right people for this job. Now I should mention they resorted to this not because it, you know everything was just going hunky-dory. It's because they're working on these trains and weird things are happening. Like after they've been parked for a while, you can't turn them back on. The little thing that's supposed to lift and connect and get electricity won't lift. Things just go into weird states that should be very simple and, and work. And so they were highly suspicious of Nevag um, for whatever reasons, maybe previous dealings or something else. But something led them to be so suspicious that they decided to hire some hackers to look at this train. Now, the three guys that ended up looking at it are Mr. Tick, Q3K, and Redford. There's a CCC talk that they give where they give all the details of this. And there are a lot of details, way more than I can go into in this show. Now, it turns out getting the code from the trains was not actually the hard part. Usually, that's the part that's the, I would say, maybe not the toughest, but it's definitely a challenge, is extracting firmware from something that's locked down. These PLC controllers that run the train. What is a PLC? A PLC is a programmable logic controller. It's like an Arduino, but bigger. <laughs> they were actually able to get the code just by sending small chunk requests, reading like a thousand bytes of memory at a time. Now, what they found are a few interesting things. Things like there's GPS coordinates in the firmware of some of these trains. And if those trains happen to go to certain places, they just don't work anymore after that. They've added a very clever mechanism, geofencing. So the train would only lock if it stays. <laughs> so. You can the train would lock only if it stays in these random locations. So let's try to draw these random locations on map. So the first location is the main competitor of Nevak, Pesa Bydgoszcz. That's the second biggest manufacturer of trains in Poland and their workshops. That's the third workshop owned by Pesa in Minsk Mazowiecki. That's the SPS workshop that was still in construction when those stuff was implemented. That's, that's, that's called future proof. <laughs> yeah. That's another competitor, Fablock from very nice sounding uh, city of Chanów. Then that's the SPS we were hired by. But wait, the there's indicate. more. And there is the manufacturer workshop in Nowy Sąd, but it has an additional condition, which was disabled on all of the trains. So for debugging purposes, they could enable also the geofencing trap at their own workshop to test <laughs> if it really works. They also had things like if the train hadn't run for a certain number of days, only Nevag could turn that train back on and start it up. No one else would be able to do it. There were even some key code combinations, like at the console of the train, you could press some buttons, and those buttons would re-enable the train. So a lot of, lot of things that were 
you could say, highly questionable. Who knows who would do something like this? Could be anybody. Now, in total, Mr. Tick, Q3K, and Redford were able to look at about 30 different trains, and 26 of those trains had different versions of software. This is great for reverse engineering because you can perform a diff on all these different versions and see what's different about them and why, like the one that's not running versus the one that's running. Now, the whole thing is highly suspicious. Uh, Nebag is threatening to sue everybody out there, anybody that mentions anything about this. There's articles written in the papers about this whole incident and even government bodies looking into it. Now, ultimately, who loses in this whole situation is the people. The people in Poland who were trying to take a train and weren't able to because every time one of these trains would go down and get locked up and they couldn't be serviced, there was fewer and fewer trains for people to use for transportation. Now, Nevag has made a number of statements, um, everything from they didn't do it to maybe some crazy third party group decided to hack and make it look like they did it. As Mr. Tick and Q3K and Redford point out, uh, it would be incredibly hard for someone else to download all this code from these trains, reverse engineer it, then try to subvert it and make it look like it was the manufacturer that was doing it. I mean, is it technically possible? It's like, yeah, I guess anything's technically possible, but is it the most probable? I don't know, you tell me. All right, enough choo-choo trains. Now in this video, it's quite short. It gives you a crap ton of information, super fast, mostly about the MIPI DSI protocol, which is a protocol to communicate with LCD screens like directly. So not like a display port connection or a VGA connection. Now he shows cool stuff about how to discover like from a completely unknown screen, what the pinout would be, how to drive the screen, everything else with various boards. So if you're into driving LCD screens and you want to figure out how to do it, definitely his channel is the one to watch. There's two things, two key things I picked up from that video. There's a command protocol and a video protocol to drive these screens. So if you want to send video, there's one way to send stuff, to send video to displays. And if you want to just place images and text and other things, there's another way to drive the screen. Now the screens also aren't plug and play, which means you can't just connect to it, send data, disconnect. You connect to it, you send an initialization string of some kind that's unique to each screen and to get this thing to kick on, to be in command mode or video mode and then send the data. And so considering these Apple screens are completely undocumented, he had to figure all that out. And so he shows you how he used a logic analyzer and oscilloscope and all the cool stuff that you would do to figure out these protocols. By the way, they can be really high speed. So he talks about how he did it with one logic analyzer, which is not as fast, and then using an oscilloscope uh, with some kind of uh, questionable wiring connections, but he still figured it out even with that. Now a story that's making its rounds like crazy is this Game Boy Advance kind of hack that was figured out to dump a Game Boy cartridge game through the audio port. So the, apparently there's a way you can plug and unplug a cartridge. You do something, you cause it to crash. And when it crashes, it just starts playing some crazy sounds out of the speakers for like hours. And part of those sounds that come out are actually sounds from the game that was there. And so what they figured out is that if you take this data, you capture it, it's actually the full ROM of the game that's being played out of the speaker. So some kind of crash that occurs where it's just looping through all of its memory and dumping it out of the speaker. So if you could listen to it close enough, it's like an old modem or something where you could hear the data and decode it. And that's exactly what they do. It's quite a process. The video is pretty hilarious and they show you all the various steps and what did and didn't work to try to get the data from this thing. Now you need as clean of a signal as possible because you're talking about an 8-bit level that's coming out of there, 256 different levels out of the speaker that you're gonna try to pick up in the waveform and turn back into binary data. While I was watching it, it reminded me of the old school scanner cell phone pager days where when scanners first came out, they could hear cell phone conversations um, and they could also hear the data channels that were used for cellular communications for the old analog cellular phones. And so, you know, the government quickly had all these scanner manufacturers block these frequencies so you couldn't receive it. Well, what could you do besides just listen to calls? From those scanners, you could actually modify them 
to receive the data so it would hear the data that's being broadcasted between a cell phone and the tower. The data being broadcasted was the serial number and the phone number. Those two things, called the ESN and the MIN, if you put those into another cell phone, you basically cloned it and you could make calls on their account. Um, there was a number of people that did that during the time and a, a whole big thing, they tried to add different countermeasures to stop it and ultimately cell phones advanced so that you couldn't do that same attack. Now you just do SIM swapping or whatever. So I guess it's not gone, it's just a different way of doing it. But in order to make that work, to decode that data, you couldn't just take the amplified stuff like right out of the headphone port. What you would do is go inside the scanner, you tap an area called the discriminator. That was before the amplifier, the audio amplifiers got to it and would distort the signal. So I kind of wonder if inside the Game Boy it's the same, if there's a, a pre-amplified stage or something else that you might be able to get to to get a really clean source of data that's coming out before it gets to the headphone jack. Now I want to do a follow-up on the Tetra story that I talked about a while back. Tetra's a trunked radio that's used by countries all around the world for police, military, all kinds of things. And it's also used in a data capacity for buses and rails and critical infrastructure. And I mean, it's all over the place carrying super sensitive stuff uh, around the world. The guys Midnight Blue, who initially put out their research, gave a follow-up talk at CCC about what's been going on since that first talk and, and how hilarious the encryption levels were on the TEA1 algorithm. And they talked about how simple it was in the first talk. And Etsy and these other guys came back, manufacturers, and they say, well, that's theoretical. And yeah, I guess with the hardware of today, you can hack it. But, you know, back in the 90s, this was probably like high security stuff. So how about we just put this discussion to rest? Let's not assume, uh, let's not use reasonable equipment. Let's see what this boy can do. <laughs> Which tells you that even crappy consumer hardware in the 90s running Windows were able to crack this supposed secure encryption that was used around the world. After 12 and a half hours, the key is found, demonstrating the feasibility of cracking TA1 on 90s consumer hardware. Now, as usual, vendors are spreading misinformation and Everybody that seems to be involved in this thing, not on the customer side, but in people who have a vested interest in the propagation of it, are saying, well, it's still secure and you don't have to worry about that and all these things. I mean, I think we really just got to go hack the crap out of anything running Tetra so that people will wake up and actually do something about it. Now, if you enjoy reverse engineering news, subscribe, consider becoming a Patreon, pick up some merch. I mean, if you're going to drink coffee, you might as well drink it from a reverse engineering mug. Now, I'm on most of the various social media platforms. You can check them down in the description. If you got ideas for new segments that I should pick up or other things that would be interesting on the Richesum channel, let me know. If you've got something cool that you think, hey, it'd be cool if that guy took that apart and showed the world what's inside, send it to me. Until next time, thanks for watching.